It's so good to be here. Uh, I was thinking as I was getting ready uh, for this, I was thinking about one of my favorite stories in the Bible, and I've been praying about what to share, uh, because honestly, uh, sharing to a group like you is one of the hardest audiences to be in front of. Uh, I can talk to students all day long, you know, uh, junior hires, high school kids, college kids, but when I get in front of a group of leaders like you, it's, um, it's hard, because honestly, I don't feel like I have much to say. And, uh, and I just say that in all uh, honesty, that's not me trying to have humility or false humility. It's just that I've heard a lot of you speak. I know it's great. I know that if I open God's word, I'll probably say something wrong. And, uh, and you guys will know that, <laughs> right? Uh, and so it's an interesting dynamic. But man, I'm just excited to be here. But I was thinking about the story of uh, David and Goliath in 1 Samuel 17. And, and I think about this story a lot. Uh, when I first read uh, the story of David and Goliath, um, you know, I, I used to want to be like David, you know, when I was a kid. I, I think uh, uh, probably a lot of us wanted to be like David. You know, I remember in Sunday school, uh, we used to have the felt board uh, in my Sunday school, which today, if I say that in front of a young audience, I've lost all relevance. But, uh, but when you said this, felt you pick kind of the character you want, and, and all the boys would be like fighting for who could be David, you know, because David is just this hero in the story. Um, as I grew a little older, I started to read the story of David and Goliath, and when I was a college kid, I started to read it almost as a story about revival. And you say, well, what do you mean? It's not really a story about revival. But I just kind of read it as a college kid, and I, I read the, about this situation where the odds are totally stacked against this people. And I read about the despair, and I read about these Israelites hiding. In fact, if you read it, they've been hiding for 40 days. They've been crying out to God for help, right? And on the 40th day, here comes this teenager, right? It's this unlikely kind of uh, hero of the story, or as we think of it, the hero of the story. And I just think of it as this is a story of what happens in revival, because all these people, as they see David come and go to the battle lines, um, none of them were putting their hope in young David. Right? I, I like to think of it, if they were a social media generation like ours, and you were in those foxholes for 40 days, and all of a sudden you see this pipsqueak coming out of the king's tent, and now marching to Goliath, you're thinking in your mind, we're dead. Right? This is it. I mean, if they had Twitter, it would have been, this will be my final tweet, goodbye world. Right? Instagram would be like, this is the look of death. Right? I mean, there wasn't a lot of confidence going on in that moment. Um, I don't know if we realize that sometime, right? But nobody knew David. Like, David wasn't this hero. David hadn't earned his stripes. He's just this kid. I mean, that's why it's Saul, when David comes to him, he's like, you're just a boy. You're, you're just a boy. What do you mean you want to take on the king? You're just a boy, right? But all of a sudden, David goes out to the battlefield, and I just picture all these people. I mean, their only hope at this point is to cry out to God even more and probably prepare, you know, for their final words, and yet, as the giant falls, I believe, it, it literally is in that moment, I believe the whole nation's eyes were raised from the battlefield back up to where their eyes should have been in the first place. Because it's so easy for them to be distracted by the giant, right? It's so easy for them to be intimidated by the size of this giant. You know, and I know Malcolm Gladwell's book talks about maybe uh, Goliath, you know, had a, you know, sight or different problems. And obviously, there's great insights. We can look at these things. But at the end of the day, I think, man, something happened in that moment that shifted the spiritual climate of that nation, right? And all of a sudden, these people who were terrified, looking at the battlefield, well, all of a sudden it says they let out with a shout. And there's something that happened. The, the people were filled with hope again. And in so many ways, when I was a college kid, I'm like, that's what happens when God gets a hold of a young person's life. Because nobody thinks that young person is going to do anything. Right? Nobody looks at little Johnny or little Susie and says, oh man, I'm expecting them to lead a revolution on their school. Right? But when they look at you, they kind of do expect that. You know, when I look at Dick Eastman, I'm like, awesome things are going to happen when Dick Eastman walks in a room. You just know. I mean, he's a leader, right? I mean, he just does stuff and it's awesome. You know, and at some point for me, I'm afraid that as I get older and people look at, oh, now Nick's been to seminary and oh, now Nick has had 10 years of ministry under his belt. And it's like, man, I don't want people to think about that, you know, because like when I read it's honestly like so often God loves to use the unlikely ones, right? Because like when God uses little Johnny or little Susie, I'm like, man, is that little Johnny that was mooning me on the way to school last year? Right? And little Johnny comes back from school and tells a story of prayer movements and revival. Like, nobody thinks about that's Johnny's dissertation or PhD that got him there. No, people think that must be God. 
that must be God. You know, I also think it's interesting, the, the younger we are, the less layers there are between us and God. You know, I think of the difference in me now uh, as a 33-year-old father of two and me as a 19-year-old writing the Pulse paper, right? When God wanted to call me to start Pulse, there weren't a lot of barriers between, like, me and God, you know? It was, like, ramen noodles and the studying I was supposed to be doing but wasn't doing anyway, right? I mean, and there wasn't any money in the way, right? I didn't have to make any big financial decisions. Like, I mean, I didn't have any big loans due. So like when God said go, it was like, all right, let's do it. You know, but now it's like if God tells me to go tonight, I'm gonna be like, hey, I got to call my wife. I got to think about my kids. What am I going to do about my mortgage payment? <laughs> you know, what am I going to do about all these things, all these obligations? I lead an organization now. Right, I got to figure out, I go through all these checks and balances. And in some ways, I think like the older I get, the more I insulate myself actually from being able to hear God's voice. Because it's like God needs to jump through all these hoops now. Whereas like a teenager, a college kid's like, yes, God, where do you want me to go? I'm in, I'm in. You know, people have been asking me like, what are you praying for that's going to happen on July 16th on the National Mall? What's the outcome? And I love that question and I hate that question. I hate that question because I hate that all we talk about is outcomes in the church today. I hate that we want measurables in everything. And I hate that that drives fundraising. And I hate that that drives so many conversations. I filled out a foundation form recently. It asked me how many people was I going to lead to Christ this year. I'm thinking, what? How many are going to lead to Christ this year? This is the tail wagging the dog. You know, it's like, what am I, am I going to start trying to make decisions now or preach in a way to get those numbers, to preach that, do whatever, right? For me, it's like, what do I want to see on July 16th? I want an invasion of the Spirit of God in the same way. I don't know if you remember when your life was changed. Do you remember that moment? Do you remember the moment? Or maybe you don't remember the moment, but you remember that season where you're like, oh man, it was crazy. Like none of us look back to that moment and we're like, oh, it was the curriculum. <laughs> you know? It was week 4.6. It was when that preacher said whatever, man. I don't care how good that preacher is. You probably don't even remember their name. doesn't matter who the band was on stage. doesn't matter if it was a small group, a big group, a stadium, or a church. All you know is that in that moment, it felt like God was real and he saw you. And all of a sudden, you're like, I want Jesus. And nothing else mattered in that moment. He said, what do you want to see? I I want that times a million. You know, I want to see a generation that falls in love with God and is raised up and sent out and going after it. You know, when I read the story of David and Goliath, and I read it in some ways, it's kind of like a revival story. And yet when I think about this story, actually now when I read it, I would say the hero of the story isn't David. I read it now and think the hero of the story is Saul. And people are always like, what are you talking about Saul? Like no, no, none of the kids in my Sunday school class wanted to be Saul, you know? Like, that's the villain. It's one of the Old Testament villains. David is the man after God's own heart. Any Davids in the room? How many Davids are here? Any Davids? Okay, right, right. How many Sauls are in the room? <laughs> Sometimes this backfires, right? <laughs> and you're just like, your mom didn't love you. No, just, no. But, but, but really, it is interesting. It is interesting, right? And yet in this story, I don't know if you ever think about this, but in this story, David comes as a pipsqueak teenager and he's brought before the king who has earned his political stripes. Now, whether he's earned them or whether he got them, whether God gifted them to him, he's certainly done things that have earned him respect. He was the strapping, good looking, taller. He was the man. This is Saul. And, he, and David comes into Saul and David says, hey, king, don't worry about this giant problem. I have a plan that's going to take care of it. Where you imagine being called, Saul, you've been praying for 40 days for a solution. 40 days, and in comes puberty boy. Just really God. And I think it's so interesting because now this is actually the second time that we've been introduced to David this way. Because it's like, you know, when we meet David, and I've been convicted of this in my leadership lately, I'll talk about how God likes to use David's, but I always keep looking for Saul's. You know, it's like, God, I know you use the unlikely ones, but I keep looking for the likely ones. God, I know you use the unlikely, but Lord, I sure want somebody who's got a big name recognition and platform. And how good are they in front of people, right? But in this moment, Saul is there. Saul has everything to lose. I like to think about when I was a little kid. 
You know, anybody remember when you're a little kid and you jump off the ty- highest point on your playground? Right? I got a toddler who's three and a half years old. This, he is, now he's cautious, but man, the things he does, I'm like, what are you thinking? You're jumping off of things and like thinks he can climb. I was, you can't climb that. No, you cannot climb that. Your mom will kill me if she finds out I let you do this. Okay, go. You know, there's something about that youthfulness. It's not his wisdom, right? It's his foolishness. David's coming into the scene, and I think there's a youthful zeal, a foolishness that God delights in and loves to use, but Saul's the one with everything to lose. This is a teenager coming into your church planning meeting and saying, don't worry, I have a plan for the entire budget this year. You say, what? I got a plan for the service this Sunday. What? I think I'm supposed to preach, pastor. What? I mean, if you think of that, that is nothing compared to David coming into Saul with this proposition. And all of us would laugh that teenager out of our office. But Saul in this moment, something comes over him. I don't know what it is, but he decides literally to put the keys of the kingdom in the hands of this teenager. Now, we don't think about that. We think Saul didn't have anything to lose, but we forget about the proposition that Goliath made before the Israelites. He said one-on-one, winner take all. Like, there was a reason they had waited for 40 days, and it wasn't because there weren't any good fighters in Israel. I guarantee there were some good fighters in Israel. I mean, obviously, not enough to be confident to go take on Goliath. But, I mean, there's a reason it was 40 days, and it was because, man, this isn't like we can just try out whoever we want, and if they lose, oh, well, let's try another guy. No, we got one shot at this. There's one bullet in the chamber. Who is going to go? In this moment, Saul looks at David and says, go, and the Lord be with you. I don't know what was going on in that moment. I don't know what Saul was thinking. I don't know if he knew what he was thinking. But I look at that moment and I say, you know what the secret is of the, this, of the David and Goliath story? Is it was the multi-generational partnership that was happening in that moment. It was one generation commending another generation. And, you know, I back up and I say, you know, every revival story that I love to talk about with students and movements and every great hero or, or, or you know, man or woman that went after the Lord, while we love to have their story, you know, the, the, the actual, the hero behind the story is the person that was opening the door for that person, is the person who was praying for that person, is the person who was giving for that person. It was the person who gave you a shot when you didn't deserve one. Right, it was Paul Cedar meeting me on a shuttle bus in the Minneapolis <laughs> on a shuttle bus. Hey, young man, what are you doing? You know, I'm just going to tell some people about Jesus. I love telling people about Jesus. What do you do? He's like, I'm going to do this thing with Luis Palau team. Oh, I love the Luis Palau team. And Paul just takes me under his wing. He's like, hey, you should come sit at this table with me. Hey, you should come be a part of this with me. I mean, every movement of God has multi-generational partnership at its core. In fact, if you think about it, think about these two heroes, in the, or two figures in the Old Testament, two people. Think about Saul and then think about Moses, okay? Two people. They both obviously have a very different trajectory and a very different kind of memory of how they go down. Think about it. Two leaders called by God, both of them, handpicked by God to lead their people. Both of them sinned, had God's hand taken off of them. Okay, I'm going to raise up someone else. The difference between Moses and Saul, and I'm being simple here, but the difference is how they chose to treat the next generation. Saul tried to kill David. Moses gave some of the richest scripture in the Old Testament, empowering young Joshua. How are we going to decide to empower and raise up a generation Now, I just got some slides here just to talk about this together, 2016. What is it? What are we praying for? We're praying for a reset. We're praying that this generation would come back to Jesus. We're praying that we would come back to our purpose. We're praying that they would follow Jesus. They're being reset from a million things. They're being reset to following him. There's some words we use in our prayer. We pray for a shift from these things. Because in our nation, we see a lot of division. Anybody with me? It's everywhere, isn't it? Racial division, religious division, political division, generational division. I mean, we're so divided in our churches. We're divided in our prayer groups. You know, it's like we're praying against that. Lord, you reset. We see a lot of apathy. We see unbelief. You know, the hardest thing for me as an evangelist when I come back and say, man, we had 500 kids come to know Jesus. And people are like, yeah, right. Like that that is the first reaction that we have is, 
Oh, whatever. It's like, what? I mean, people don't believe. Do you guys see this? And let's be honest, in our own hearts, we don't believe. Right? I mean, we get jaded. Do you remember the first time you were a kid and you heard a God story from the front? You're like, oh my gosh, did you hear that? It's happening. You know, now you're like, yeah, I've been there, done that. It's like, God, would you renew us again? God, would you renew us again? Movement from shame to grace, from pride to humility, from fear to hope, and from hate to love. I think we should do something called Love 2020. Anybody? I think that would be a great idea if the church actually became known for love. Now, I got a video. I'm going to skip over it, Chris. There's a bunch of people that have been coming behind this. A lot of you have been, uh, I mean, in fact, I could go through this room and just name I me. Mean, Claude Alexander last week was encouraging me on the phone and helping me rally people. Um, you know, Dave Ferguson's here, and they've been rallying their network and just opening doors and just showing so much grace and just, just it's been incredible. I mean, the people that are here, I was talking to Kathy, you know, in 2013, I met Kathy out in, fr- in front of Ravi Zacharias's office, and we just had this God meeting, and that was when we were first kicking off this thing. And so to, to come here and be like, now Kathy's taking over Love 2020, I'm like, this is the coolest thing ever. This is the coolest thing ever. Does anybody think Kathy's awesome, by the way? She's going to be awesome, right? She's just going to do amazing. And, you know, these are just some people who have come together for the mall, you know, uh, Francis Chan and a bunch of artists. People are like, well, is it a concert? Is it, what is it? Like, no, we just want to go after Jesus. You know, we just want, and man, whatever brings people there, we don't care what brings them there. We know what we're going to do there. We're going to seek God. We're going to pray for an invasion of the kingdom of God. These are some of the things that we're praying for leading up to it. Uh, you can check out the website, but we're, we're rallying a million intercessors. Uh, we're, we're going on a thousand campuses right now. People are going from campus to campus. We're praying for 300 organizations to partner together. In fact, if you're not a part of this right now, I would really ask you to rally with us. Now, I just want to be clear. I don't lead an organization called Together. Together isn't anyone's thing. Uh, we're not trying to sell t-shirts or books called Together or whatever. I mean, this is literally just, it's called Together because it's about John 17 unity and we want to rally the church to lift up Jesus because we believe what Jesus said when he prayed that he prayed that we would be one so that the world would believe. And so we believe there's something supernaturally powerful about when we come together and the agenda is Jesus. We think that's all we need. We say, what are you going to do? We're going to pray and ask Jesus to come. So what else are you going to do? We're going to pray and ask Jesus to come. What else are you going to do? We're going to ask you, what are you doing listening to me right now? Are you paying attention? We need Jesus. In my Bible, when times are hard, there's one solution. It's call the people together and seek him. It's come back to your first love. That's the only solution I know of. And so we're like, you know what? We believe we're supposed to rally people. We're going to book the National Mall, no matter how crazy that is. There's a bunch of young Davids. You know, we weren't even picked first or second or third or fourth or tenth. Right? But you know what? We believe God wants our nation back. And we believe people are praying. And so we've been asking ministries and leaders, like, man, is there room in your schedule for the Holy Spirit to call an audible and to say, this wasn't in your plan, pastor or ministry leader, but it's been in my plan. Man, I just think there's so much, gosh, there's so much busyness in the church today. It's like we don't even have room in our margin for God to say, here, there. And we're just praying, God, what would happen if your church rallied? What could God do in a day? Now, we got specific things. We're praying for 100,000 people to respond. We're working with the Bible app and American Bible Society. We want to see 5,000 prayer groups launch. We want to see 200,000 young people. We want to reverse the trend of biblical illiteracy. How many of you guys think it's a problem that people aren't in their Bibles? We think that's a problem. And so we're not trying to solve everything. In fact, we're just trying to get people to follow Jesus. And for us, that looks like getting them to pray. It looks like getting them to start reading their Bibles. It looks like getting them to start sharing their faith. Okay, we're just starting there. We're not trying to solve the problems of all the world. No, we're just saying, can we come together under the banner of Jesus and seek him? You know, uh, it was five years ago, I got to go meet Billy Graham and uh, I've been trying to meet Billy Graham for a long time because, as Lon said, I was going to be Billy Graham. <laughs> and, um, you know, I was talking to Billy about 
all these questions I had. And I said, you know, what about this? And what about this? And what about this? And what about this? I went in there with all these questions. And, and every question I'd ask, he'd say, Nick, you need to seek the Lord. You need to seek the Lord. He said, Dr. Graham, how do I be a good husband? You need to seek the Lord, Nick. Nick, how do I be a faithful evangelist? You need to pray and seek the Lord. How do I do this? You need to pray and seek. Like, it didn't matter what question I asked Billy Graham. It was like, I need to pray and seek the Lord. And it wasn't at all like this isn't just kind of this old guy who doesn't know anything. No, he was sharp. In fact, at one point I said, you know, Dr. Graham, we're praying for a million people to come together on the National Mall. And I didn't really understand the backstory of this, but I tell you, the whole conversation went great. But in that moment, he lit up, he sat up in his chair, and he says, we got to do this. You know, and I literally felt like we were going to go hop in the Winnebago and road trip it. Like, it just was, it was so real. I was like, let's go, Billy, let's go. I'll take out your security guards. Let's do it. You know? But um, come to find out, uh, Tom Phillips told me recently that, was it, when was it, Tom? 2010? When, when Billy had the vision of seeing a gathering on the mall? 2010, Tom said, Dr. Graham calls him and says, I have a vision that America needs revival. We need to call the nation to the National Mall. And we need to pray. And so we called up Tom, because Tom's the man. And Tom called the churches, and they started calling around. And that was around the time when Dr. Graham got sick. And so they had to call it off. And so little did I know that part of the reason Dr. Graham is so excited in this moment is because he's brought in this pipsqueak from North Dakota with the same vision that God had given him, you know, four or five years before. And I know so many of you guys have had a similar vision of praying. Like, this isn't anybody's vision. We're praying for revival. We need it now. We need it now. I'm going to close this with a word of prayer. Uh, man, I'm just so grateful for you guys. I just want to honor you. Uh, we just love you. We love you. We love you. And, uh, and let's just do this. Let's believe God to do the impossible because he can do it. He's not intimidated. I was listening to those lyrics. In fact, I was on my, on my face when, when uh, that last song we sang, right? Uh, help me be my vision and, and, and give me eyes to see what you see. Help me not to be overwhelmed. You know, because I'm going to be honest, you, when you're facing the giant or whatever, it's terrifying. But I will say this. There's something liberating about being a part of something where the only explanation is we're doomed unless God. Steve Douglas said to me recently, he said, Nick, you guys have a really good team, but there's no way this is going to happen with you guys. <laughs> and he's like, I mean that in a positive way. He's like, I believe God's going to do this, and I believe he's going to get the glory for it. You know, in one of our team meetings, it's like, Throw reality out the window. Like, if anybody says that seems unrealistic, we're like, we're planning an event on the mall. You know, like, what, what, what dream or what idea is, is unrealistic? Like, what, you know, we've been praying for the Pope to do something, and we got a call last week that he's recording a video for us for the National Mall. You know, I mean, it's like, God, what can you do? The better question is, what can't God do? Let me just pray. Um, God, I know that uh, Johnny's going to come up here in a little bit. Lord, I thank you for her life and her legacy. God, I thank you for the way that you've used her to speak to so many of us, to challenge us from your word. So, Lord, we pray that as you've done thousands of times, God, that you would use your servant to equip your saints, to challenge us, God. And, Lord, for all of us in this room, Lord, God, we just want you, Jesus. God, we don't want to look back at five years ago or 20 years ago or 50 years ago and say, that was when I was really on fire. God, we want to fast more today than we've ever fasted. God, we want to pray more. We want to read more. We want to love you more. God, we don't want to hold anything back. God, if you come back tomorrow, we don't want to be like, man, look at our big savings account or look at how we were. No, we want to be like, God, we were all in. Lord, so we just surrender right now, God. And we're praying that you would revive us again. You're faithful, God, Lord. We believe in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.